Lass uns mal kurz über Dave Snowden sprechen. Komplexität. Sollen wir das gerade auf Englisch machen? Ja, das müssen wir auf Englisch machen. Sorry. Genau. Weil Dave ist ja auch schon yeah, bereit. Ja, Dave ist hier already, so um, uh, yeah. you give the intro, Dave gives the keynote. Okay, there he is. Uh, Dave Snowden is a Welsh management consultant and a researcher in the fields of knowledge management and the application of complexity science. He will talk to us about the one thing that brings us together today, Agile. Today, Agile has many variations, and we have to ask ourselves if they get increasingly harmful and what we need to do to get back to the idea of the original Agile manifesto. Dave, can you hear me? That doesn't sound like it. Dave, are you here? Can you hear us? Oh. <laughs> But he's still in the meditation um, uh, mode. There's a yes in the background, at least, but that's probably not what he wants to say. Ah, uh -huh. now he puts his... Dave, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you yet. That may be... I, I would be uh, in need of the um, you're on mute card <laughs> of Lisette. <laughs> Lisette. That's what I would put up now. Can but you hear me now? It's also uh, a technical no. glitch that we have. Dave, say something again, please. Yeah, hi there. I'm speaking. Ah, awesome. Can anybody hear me? Um, so Did that I work? fear you missed our um, awesome introduction of yourself now. Sorry But about that. We only spoke highly of you, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you know yourself already. Yeah, I think. I'm never sure about that these days. Yeah, we, we never shouldn't be sure, uh, too, uh, too sure about whether we know ourselves or not. Um, you want to talk to us today about complexity, correct? Yeah, well, that's part of, the, part of the subject, yeah. Cool. Then um, after fixing some technical glitches, the stage is yours. Okay. So the goal is to speak for about um, 40, 45 minutes and allow time for questions. The title of this is Rewild in Agile. Uh, for those of you involved in ecological change, you'll know the rewilding concept is a very important one which isn't a sort of nostalgic return to the past, but it's restoring the natural balance of the system. Now, if you want to look at a metaphor for this, um, I'm going to use dogs at the start and cats at the end. Right? Um, so this is a timber wolf. Uh, it's one of about four or five different types of canine species which live in the wild. Um, wolves are actually really important to most ecosystems. Um, there's a big campaign in the UK to reintroduce them at the moment because the deer population is out of control and they were originally the apex predator. Um, if you actually go on to Google and search on trophic cascade wolves Yellowstone, you'll find the story of what happened when wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park. Um, they've been hunted to extinction as a result of which deer overgraze riverbanks and overgrazed slopes. Um, so you get soil decay, you get water pollution, you get all sorts of negative consequences within the ecosystem. When they reintroduced wolves into the system, the deer were predated, they couldn't graze the, the riverbanks, the rivers clan, ran clear again. And it's a good illustration of a balanced ecosystem. If you remove a key element of the system, then everything starts to decay. Now, one of the problems we've got with human beings is we like to domesticate things. So that's the wild, yeah, the wolf, where everything comes from. When we get into domestication, we end up with this. Lots and lots of different species, highly differentiated, but not remotely resilient compared with the original um, wolf. Yeah. Um, some of these look really weird, right? Now, part of my argument is this is what has happened to our job. So if you look at the overall problems that we have 20 years ago, or just coming up to 20 years ago, um, it's the 20th anniversary of the manifesto um, next, next year, if you didn't know. 
And ironically, something I'm going to come to later, the 21st anniversary of the creation of the Kinevin framework. So these things have gone a bit hand in hand. Um, when Agile was originally created at Snowbird, it was a group of, as it happens, all male programmers who just got together and talked about things and came up with a manifesto. And that was all cool. Um, you have three principal sources, XP, um, DSDM, and DSDM goes back further, Dynamic Systems Design Methodology. That was actually, I was one of the three who created the um, business for that many years before, um, where three of us got together in the pub in Cheltenham. Myself, my equivalent in our deadly rivals and competitors, Logica, and also Ed from Cambridge. And that's where that, that particular consortium came from. I think it shows a British-American difference. Uh, we got together over a meal in a the pub. They got into a ski resort for a week. Um, but you also then had Scrum, and Scrum actually existed before, before the manifesto. Now, there's an interesting balance here between a lot of the vision of the Agile Manifesto really comes from XP, from extreme pro programming, um, from people like Kent Beck and the like. Um, but the thing which scales Agile is actually Scrum. Now, the thing to realize about Scrum, and this is a key thing to understand on scaling anyway, is that Scrum is highly codified. It works at a what's called a high level of abstraction. So this is a key concept from Max Brasso's book, iSpace. If you have high codification and high abstraction, then you get high diffusion. If you have low codification and low abstraction, you, diffusion is difficult. So abstraction in this, this case means kind of like a developed language, a developed set of symbols. So if you look at a map, um, there are complex symbols on maps which are understood by all users. And because we have that common set of symbols, that common set of language, yeah, we've got a high level of abstraction in terms of what we're dealing with. So Scrum had that high level abstraction. It had structure. It was highly codified. And therefore, it was easy for it to diffuse. And what actually happened is de facto Agile um, became Scrum for a period. And for many people, it still is. I find the irony of this is that if it had scaled around the ideas of XP, it would probably be more authentic to the original. And when I said that at a conference in Scotland, all the XP people cheered me, but then I sort of added thing and they're still worried about this. And I said, the problem is nobody understands anybody who works in XP, which is why it didn't scale. So this is balanced in anything novel. How far do you codify? How far do you abstract? The more you do that, the more you scale, the more people who use it, but the more you lose the original. And the more you get this extreme species um, differentiation. So you know, when Ken set up um, Scrum, he created effectively an approach by which you have a highly codified method, you have certificates in that, and it's owned by a single company. And since then, we've had a splurge yeah, of multiple methods, multiple tools, multiple techniques. Yeah, all of which are claimed to be unique and all of which have actually focused on, on certification. I'm going to make this point up front. Um, what I call the certification scam, by which you basically turn up for a two or three day course, get a certificate based on an open book exam, and then do a regular read of slides every year that you um, kind of like pay for update, is not what being a profession is about, but it's what a large part of the Agile movement now is. The other problem, so uh, part of what I'm arguing at the moment, and I'll come back to how we do this later, is we need to get a little bit, we need to swing the pendulum back a bit. We've become over-codified, over-structured, and that means we're losing resilience. Um, Agile has also become highly commodified, um, and that's normally the indication that a movement is reaching the end of its life cycle. And Agile's had about 20 years, which isn't bad. Um, for a management method or tool, because what happens is you get this huge originality, this sort of inspiration, isn't everything wonderful, and it's only bought by early adopters or early majority buyers. Then it becomes a norm, what everybody does, at which point people move in and codify it. And there's two strong indicators of that. One is the big consultancy firms have moved in on mass over the last two or three years, and they always come in at the end of the life cycle and commodify heavily. 
And the other thing is the growth of things like SAFE, which I'm sorry if anybody's offended by this. Well, actually, I'm not really. Is the antithesis of Agile. It's everything Agile was not meant to be. But that happens at the late stage of a life cycle. You get massive consolidation. You effectively get an apex predator. And just as IBM consolidated the computer market in the 80s and 90s, yeah, and then became complacent, you get the same sort of phenomenon. Um, the other problem we got is is a lot is this much misused word in Agile, which is called empiricism. Now, empiricism is linked to scientific method and to a whole body of philosophy. Um, and it means proper and rigorous investigation. It doesn't mean the things that worked for me the last two or three times I did a project, which is what it does mean for a lot of Agile. And it also doesn't mean I've studied eight or nine companies or 10 or 15 companies who I've deemed to be successful. And this is what I've identified they do. So if we do these things, we too will be successful. Um, in real science, that's caused the conf called the confusion of correlation with causation. Um, so the fact that about 60 or 70 percent of American um, top Fortune 500 companies um, have CEOs who play golf uh, doesn't mean that playing golf is the causal factor in success. Um, and doesn't mean we should substitute golf lessons for a master, for an MBA program, although, to be quite honest, probably be more effective than a lot of them. Um, the other example I love is if any country in Europe wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes it wins, and this is a nice one, you'll enjoy this one, is all it has to do is increase dark chocolate consumption, because the consumption of dark chocolate per head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes for head of population for several decades. And that actually has a lot more data behind it than most of the management textbooks you'll read. Now, kind of like you get some good ones. I mean, you know, good to great would be a, an example of somebody who did proper and rigorous research um, over companies which had longevity and that spawned a whole body of consultancy methods. But if you never look, you find most of those companies have actually failed. And the reason is he didn't understand the context. He actually picked companies which were the first into their market. In fact, they were the apex predator, the wolf. And therefore, the ecosystem organized around them. So they survived no matter how incompetent they were until the ecosystem shifted. So we got a better, easier explanation. And all of the recipes in that book, Good to Great, yeah, are kind of like problematic as a result because they don't understand that context. As I say, all the companies he kind of like identified have failed in various ways. So you've got to be careful. Um, another couple of examples in Agile, which is worth mentioning. So Lean Startup is used by a lot of people in Agile. And this is based on studies of companies who succeeded in Silicon Valley and the identification of things they had in common. Now, when I was in IBM, we did an equivalent study with Dorothy Leonard at Harvard Business School. Um, but we also studied the companies who failed as well as the companies who succeeded. And we found, ironically, in the companies who succeeded, more or less all the same things you see in lean startups. This was published you know, two decades before. But we also found that the companies who failed did exactly the same thing. Now, you have to study the negative as well as the positive. And the reason is you're dealing with entrepreneurs, you're dealing with a huge market. There are so many players in that market, some of them are bound to succeed. Yeah. Um, and therefore you can't assume that because you studied a small subset of that, you've got a pattern that you can follow in the future. doesn't mean that you don't have good advice, but yeah, you've got to be careful. And then we get um, uh, one of my most disliked books, which is called Reinventing the Organization by Lacroix. Which basically, although I, you know, I love his ideology, which is quasi-religious in nature, his evidence gathering is non-existent. He only selects the aspects of the cases which match his hypothesis. And again, that's bad science. So we've got a real problem on this. And the people are throwing together methods and tools based on limited experiences. Yeah? If you look at the background to SAFE, it's actually very limited. And it's based on self-reported um, examples. So I say this, this is a deep problem. So what we're starting to do instead is to look at a different approach. And this is called naturalizing sense making, where we start off with what the natural sciences tell us about systems and about people. 
And we use that as a constraint because natural science has been subject to experiments. And the experiments have been done by lots of people from lots of different backgrounds. And so we've actually got that validation. We can depend on it and we can create predictions. The other reason to fall back to this is we live in times of considerable uncertainty. Um, I've just finished um, writing the European Union handbook on crisis and complexity management, uh, which is rather ironic given the stupidity of the English and taking us out of Europe. We're blaming the English for this, um, just to be clear. Um, but one of the key points we're making in that is when you go through a major crisis and COVID, we are not going to come out of this the same way as we went in. You can't actually afford to use past examples um, or past case studies to inform future behavior because everything is changing. So I'll go back to an ecological example. When the meteor hits the earth and wipes out the dinosaurs, if you actually predicted who would be the next apex predator, you'd probably go for the crocodile or the shark who survived. You Dave, wouldn't go Dave, for the sorry. Yeah. Sorry to Hi. interrupt you. Um, we were just wondering, we are only getting one of the start slide from you. So yeah, you are. May ah, so you that's, are. that's, that's correct. It. Okay. Don't panic. Yeah. Uh, thank you, then uh, go on. Thank you. Yeah, you're lucky I'm even using slides. I normally don't. The, the others will go faster. Right? Um, so coming back to the point, yeah, the thing which actually survives is the first mammal, which is small and highly energy efficient. And you see the same sort of pattern in history. So IBM comes to dominate the computer industry because it repurposes its deep knowledge of punch cards yeah, to control industrial processes to create the first computer programs. But then the ecosystem changes from hardware to software. IBM almost goes bankrupt and Microsoft comes through, which is small and energy efficient. And then we move from software to ecosystems and Microsoft almost goes under, Apple take over and so on. So that's the pattern. So we can't afford to use the past to inform the future. Um, so just to make the chairman happy, I'm now going to change slides. Yeah. Um, so let's go through some of the science and talk through the implications. So I'm going to do two things now. One is the nature of how human beings make decisions, and the second is complexity. So this is from a series of experiments which have been done many times, yeah, and this is one variation of it. So you take radiologists who are highly trained, um, far better trained with a better examination system than most agileists, yeah, and they're asked to look at a series of x-rays to identify anomalies within those x-rays. And on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla in plain sight, which is 48 times larger than the average cancer nodule. And 83% of radiologists don't see it, even, even though their eyes physically scanned it. And the nasty thing is that the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83% who did. Now, this isn't something we can avoid. It's called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. And it's good and bad news. Um, it's good news because it means there's a lot out there we can discover if we just learn to look at things differently. It's bad news in that we won't do that. In fact, this one simple basic fact of natural science invalidates most approaches um, to user requirements capture, most approaches to epics, and most approaches to story points um, because they're unlikely um, to discover novelty. So I'm going to come back and mention that quite a lot. Um, but one of the ways to look at it is in the context of culture. Now, there are two words that I get really irritated with in the Agile community. Uh, when, when their favorite pet method actually hasn't worked or hasn't delivered, they say it's all the fault of culture or it's all because people don't have an Agile mindset. Now, that's kind of like not the way to look at it because the reality is culture isn't a causal factor it's an emergent property yeah the way you treat people they're the way you act and then the conversations of the water cooler are where culture comes from it's not something you can engineer or manage and you don't want to have a common culture anyway because if you have if everybody thinks the same way you've destroyed genetic variety in the system and the system has lost adaptive capacity so I'm now going to be switching between theory and tools. So let me talk about culture mapping. So mapping culture is key because you need to understand where you are in order to identify in what direction you can travel. Starting off with this is what we would like to be, so this is the culture we want or this is the mindset we've got, 
is actually quite foolish. And one of the broad principles I'm going to identify here, this is a heuristic, is in conditions of uncertainty, you should start journeys with a sense of direction, which means you can adapt your journey if necessary. You shouldn't have very specific or explicit goals. And I backed up by some other science there. In um, we know from virtually every study of human motivation that where people are working for explicit targets, it destroys intrinsic motivation. There is no evidence to contradict that. So attempting to achieve future goals can actually produce the opposite of what you want. It can actually be quite dangerous. So our approach on culture is very different. What we'll actually do is go out and gather stories from the water coolers. Um, one of the ways we do that is to ask everybody in the organization what's called a non-hypothesis question. Um, so that would be what story would you tell your best friend if they were off the job in your workplace? Yeah, there's no hypothesis in that. It elicits, it elicits a narrative. And then we present them with a series of geometrical shapes. So, for example, a triangle. Uh, which says in the story, your manager's behavior was altruistic, assertive, analytical, three positive qualities. Yeah? Uh, we're not asking a direct question because people will gain the result. And the other thing is if you're presented with three qualities, all of which you know are good, it creates a cognitive load. Uh, one of the advantages of having a visiting chair in the psychology department is that I can wire up students and do tests on this. By creating a cognitive load, you switch from what's called thinking fast to thinking slow. People have to reflect more, so you dive deeper. So with six triangles, for example, we'll get 18 data points associated with the story. And from that, um, we can draw a map like this. Um, ignore the Greek letters for the moment. Um, and this is also used effectively for mass sensing. But here, I've actually looked at the pattern of the story and I've got four tribes, and we can cut this by demographic. We can cut it by various factors. You've got green, purple, orange, and blue. And effectively, what that says is there are four cultures in this organization, and some of them are stronger than others, and some of them overlap. So the purple culture has some overlap with orange and green, so they're going to be able to talk to each other. But the blue culture is an outlier. So that might be the 17% of our company who are seeing things that we're not seeing and nobody's listening to them. Or it might be a bunch of deviants who we have to pull in, we don't know. Now, the way we find out is to actually click on the map and look at the stories they told. What story would you tell your best friend? So what we've got is the objectivity and statistical power of numbers backed up by the persuasive power of narrative. Now, if it turns out that's a bad area and the omega point is your end point, so you know, that's your desired state, and I put it in the top right of the matrix because they always are there, then the travel time between alpha and omega is just too big. There's no connections of any nature. There's no pathway that you can follow. Um, so it's actually going to be quite dangerous. So you're better actually taking a series of stepping stones, the beta and gamma stages, and this is in complexity science, which I'm going to come to in a second, is called an adjacent possible. So I literally click on the beta area and look at the stories. And then I say to people, how would we create more stories like these? Then I click on the alpha area and fewer stories like those. Now, more stories like this, fewer stories like those is a whole new theory of change. It's called vector theory of change because you're effectively shifting things. You're measuring direction of travel, speed of travel for intensity of effort. And also, you're not saying to people, so that's, for example, suppose you do this by capturing your customers' experiences of you as an agile team. You're not saying to your team in a retrospective or whatever, we need to be more customer focused, and they'll say we are. You're saying we need more customer stories like these and fewer customer stories like those. And that requires, although this is based on really sound theory, it requires no theoretical understanding to implement it. So shifting people's cultures and attitudes is about that sort of direction. Uh, we also, by the way, use this for um, peace and reconciliation, uh, where we'll present a situational assessment to four or 5,000 people, get them to interpret it in real time, from that, draw these maps and identify the areas where people will be able to have a conversation. 
And that's actually quite important in conflict situations and companies as well. So that's the first of the sort of tools I'm going to talk about is we know that culture is a major factor. It isn't a causal factor, it's an affordance factor. So if you have roughly the right sort of culture, things will go in the right direction. But you don't want to have a single culture that's dangerous. Uh, one of the phrases we, we use for that is called coherent heterogeneity rather than homogeneity. And the way I normally illustrate that is, as you probably realize by now, I'm Welsh. Um, I support a rugby team called Cardiff Blues, who are a highly um, professional team and never commit any you know, transgressions on the pitch, always respect the referee and have civilized supporters and play a wonderful game of rugby, but other people cheat. I mean, those bastards down the road in Planetly, um, you know, constantly transgress, bribe the referees and are generally not trustworthy. Um, but when the English arrive, we're Welsh and we're all one, we're all one, one on the team. And that's called coherent heterogeneity. I have differences that in certain contexts disappear. And that creates more resilience in the ecosystem. That's again, returning to the wild. The second thing, and this is the, the other thing where I'm gonna develop four or five tools, is complexity theory. Now this is a definition from Brian Arthur, who was the first to apply complexity theory in economics. And a key thing to understand about a complex system is that everything is entangled with everything else. I've used a fishing net there as an example. Um, and because everything is entangled, um, another phrase, if you ever go into a walk you know, in the country and you try and get through what in England we call a thicket, which is a small wood. So it's lots of shrubs, lots of trees, lots of bramble bushes, lots of undergrowth. Yeah? Um, it's very difficult to negative to actually um, navigate. It's very difficult to break through other than if you use a machete and destroy things because all the plants, although we know they're separate, are deeply entangled with each other in ways that we can't understand. And if we take one plant, we don't know what the effect will be elsewhere within the system. And this is the only thing we can ever know for certain about a complex adaptive system, is that anything we do will produce unexpected consequences and therefore we have to be ready for them. So a complex adaptive system, and this is a key phrase, has no linear causality. You don't get predictable futures, but you can actually measure the probability that a system will change and the directions of travel for a system which are feasible and viable. And I just gave you an example of that, with that what we call a fitness landscape, that contour map. You need to map the present rather than trying to define the future. So that's basically complexity theory. And there are three fundamental principles of managing a complex adaptive system. Uh, one is you need to optimize the granularity. That means you need to deal with smaller things. Smaller things will combine and recombine in different ways. Um, again, come back to the thicket. If you've got lots of small plants which are separated, I can combine them in different ways. If I allow them to mature too far, they'll be entangled. I can't do it. So smaller units, think about the Dunbar sequence, units of five and 15 are more effective than units of 500. Information is better if it's fragmented in anecdotal form rather than highly structured. The second principle is I need to have diversity in the assessment or cognitive process. Remember, 70% of people see a gorilla, 83% don't. So the way we get around that is not to try and train people to see things that they're not going to see, but to have multiple human sensors giving feedback in real time so we can find the outliers in the different groups. And the third thing, which has a lot of consequences for development, is that we actually need to disintermediate the decision makers. The more interpretive layers there are between decision maker and raw data, the less, the more it is lost in the process. So for example, under conditions of high uncertainty, I wouldn't use story points, I'd use raw anecdotal data of real world experiences from users because I want the coder to have direct access to that. So those three principles are quite important. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not gonna go through the Kinevian framework in detail, it's well published. If you want to see its application in Agile, listen to people like Liz Keo. Um, and there's now a whole bunch of German presentations on this as well. But the fundamental principle of Kinevian 
is to basically say there are four different, well, five different types of systems. One's in which there's a clear relationship between cause and effect. So the same thing always happens the same way twice and everybody will do it the same way. Uh, there are systems which are complicated, which means that there's a range of things which are valid and experts will understand what to do. Um, and then we get into complex, which is an entangled system where nobody knows what the right thing is to do. So I have to do parallel experiments. And that's really important. Experiments in parallel to test multiple hypotheses rather than linear iteration around a single hypothesis. And then, of course, we have chaos, which is where we don't want to be, um, which is effectively the state of, of complete randomness in terms of the way it works. I'll just make one point here. One of the purposes of Kinevin is the ability to draw it on a whiteboard or the back of a table napkin from memory. And that's kind of like key to sense making. So I say, I'm just refreshing you on that because what I want to do now is to use it to make this point. This is another gaping void cartoon. And by the way, sometimes when we do cultural mapping, the way we do it is to actually present gaping void cartoons. And we've actually got a whole set we co-created with some of the Agile Manifesto founders and other prominent people in Agile, which actually deal with the Agile community. Um, so you basically present six or eight of these cartoons to your employees. They choose the cartoon which most represents the culture. They tell a story about that. And then we go back to the maps. And that is actually a lot of fun. And it actually works well, certainly in multilingual environments. But the point I'm making in this one is we don't all drive the same type of car to work. We don't all use exactly the same personal productivity tools. You need to work out when they're different and when they're the same. So. Let's start to run through some tools and techniques. So what I've done here is I've given you a picture of the Kinevin framework. Now the green areas are what are called liminal, they're called transition between domains. And the red area is kind of like a bad area. And many years ago, I created a three by three matrix which had known, unknown, and knowable against we know, yeah, we can know, and it's unimaginable. Yeah, um, I made the mistake of presenting that at a DARPA event in the Pentagon once, and then I couldn't use it thereafter uh, because it got corrupted in a famous speech by Rumsfeld. Yeah? Um, I'm bringing it back in at the moment, and I'm not going to run through this entirely, but there are key areas. So let's look at some of the consequences for software development. Firstly, there's nothing wrong with waterfall. You'll find this in writings by Martin, for example, by the head of technology at Google and elsewhere. They're basically saying Agile is like really good for you know volatile consumer products, but it's really bad for massive infrastructure projects where you know what you have to do, you know the resources you need, and you need to just get on with it. I remember working with Telstra in Australia once, um, and Agile was the in thing. So if you weren't Agile, you weren't going to be promoted, but they were working on telecoms infrastructure. They knew it was waterfall. Um, so because they were Australian, they were what we call canny in Scotland, um, they created one year sprints so that they could say they would be been agile, but they just carried on doing things the way they knew was right. Uh, there's an awful lot of that deep pragmatism um, you'll find. There's nothing wrong with waterfall. It's important to understand. Secondly, and I know some people don't like this, but I'm going to carry on with it regardless. Scrum actually isn't a framework. It's a collection of methods. If you try and make Scrum universal, you're getting things wrong. If you try and make Kanban universal, you're getting things wrong. Um, different things work in different contexts. The brilliance of Scrum is that it actually operates in that imagined unknown liminal area between complex and complicated. You've got a set of requirements that the users have articulated for you or you've helped them articulate. Yet there's ambiguity about what you do with it. So you're going to go through a series of very fast iterations to actually map it out, test it, and get it. So the strength of Scrum is its ability to move things from the complex to the complicated. And that's why it took off, because a lot of software development is about doing precisely that. Because it does linear iteration, and because it doesn't co-evolve with users, it's not so good at the purely complex. So what I want to do is to run through three techniques. So these are three of many. Uh, that we've been developing just to give you a sense of how you approach on this. And by the way, just to make the point, although the software we've developed is proprietary and we charge licenses for it, the methods we develop are going into an open source wiki 
that anybody will be able to access from the new year. Yeah? So these are being documented for that at the moment. Just like Kinevin is open source and methods for Kinevin creation are open source, so will these be as well. I, I think that's really important. So one is an actually an old DSDM technique. I haven't quite got the name for this. Some people call it daisy chain. Um, I call it a mutation JAD. And what I've done here is I've brought back joint application design workshops, which were extremely powerful. Um, they came out of they were came out of actually IBM in Canada. We picked them up in DSDM, and I actually re rebuilt a whole company around RAD and JAD, so rapid application and joint application development workshops. So the way a JAD works is it's an intensive one or two day workshop in which you have really gifted prototypers working with a diverse set of users to actually develop a prototype and a specification for a system. Um, when I was in IBM, I actually created a whole specialist workroom for this um, where we could very rapidly switch whiteboards. We could move people to it in groups. It was kind of like an orchestra um, or a complex dance. So JADs are extremely effective because one of the wider problems we've got in IT at the moment is that technology can do things users don't know, what, don't know to ask for. So if you bring users into an environment with IT people who can really understand users and with the ability to say, is this what you meant? You know, I use artists as well and UX designers and people like that. That way you can actually explore possibilities and you can reduce the cost of failure. Now, a mutation JAD is a variation on that, and I would recommend bringing back JADs, to be honest. I think they have high value. But a mutation JAD, first time we did this, we ran it in Farnborough, which is near London. And then we took the outcome of that, which was effectively a series of prototype screens. Yeah, it's a semi-functional prototype, so you could actually move between screens. It was never an operational system, but after a day, we built it. We passed it on to a team in Mumbai, and we deliberately didn't tell them what the original user requirement was. And the reason we didn't want to do that is we wanted to see what they did. So they had eight hours to just do whatever they thought might make sense, even though they didn't know the purpose. And then at the end of that eight hours, they handed it on to a team in San, San Jose who got exactly the same instruction. And then when we woke up the next day, we got back and looked at what we produced after two mutations. Now, every time I've run this, the users have looked at the result and said, oh my God, I would never have thought of that. Can I please have it? And again, this is working on a very basic biological principle and the conditions of uncertainty mutation rates um, increase because you don't know what capability you need. And that's a very simple 24 hour process which can generate more data to go into techniques like Scrum. Trios is another variation on that, and this is actually a major area for people interested in this. We're also using it for mental health at a society level, um, so for, for several purposes. So Valdis Krebs and I are running a public exploratory on this in January, which will be announced on our website um, soon. But the way we're doing it within organizations for IT is we take three people or three roles. So one is yeah, a user trained to talk to IT people. And just to say this up front, it's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than it is to train IT people to talk to users. And it's also an empowerment issue for the users. If you actually give them some basic education, they're more able to articulate and talk with IT people. So that's a user trained to talk to IT people with a young, dynamic, you know, prototyper who's straight out of college or fresh out of college who's sort of super fast. And then the third one is unlike an end system tester or a systems architect, somebody whose whole ethos is to look at the system as a whole. And that becomes a trio. And they're given two weeks to think about the problem and come up with ideas and solutions. But we don't just have one trio, we have 10 or 15 deliberately selected for diversity. Now, that way, we're introducing multiple diversity into the system. We're radically increasing our chance of finding the 17%. Um, and we're actually reducing the risk of error when we move into the other domains. Um, and then there's a whole body of work we've done. We spent the last three years looking at a complexity-based approach to design thinking, working with people from Rand Institution, MIT, Stanford, and elsewhere. 
Um, and that's been fascinating because design thinking is going through the same level as commodification is agile. It's the you know, double diamond is now on everybody's screen and there's two day training courses with certificates being offered. It's the classic end game strategy. And generally design thinking deals with what we call articulated needs and expert ideation or expert idea, idea generation. So what we've actually developed is some tools and techniques to map unarticulated needs and also to do distributed ideation. So we can now effectively have distributed ethnography capturing unarticulated needs, which experts can then look at you know, to define products. We've got expert ideation, i.e. development of a specific problem, but then presentation to large populations to generate ideas. And then we got this fascinating third area, which is called exaptive innovation. Exaptation is a key thing in the complex domain of Kinevin. The other name for that is radical repurposing. So to give you a couple of examples, in 1945, um, a Raytheon engineer noticed the significance of a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. And so he put a metal box around the magneto of the radar machine and we got microwave ovens. And I mentioned earlier, IBM repurposing punch cards to give themselves early domination in the computer industry. Uh, one of the big um, things in the EU handbook on crisis management is map what you know at a fine level of granularity and find ways to repurpose it quickly to give you first mover advantage as you come out. So that's called exact innovation. And to me, that's one of the big things for IT people to do to move away from the sort of manufacturing um, metaphor that everybody uses of a sort of linear process into something which is far more messy and much more interlinked um, with the users. Because if you can use existing capability to deal with needs that users haven't articulated, you suddenly become highly strategic. So that's kind of like finding the 17%. And as I said earlier, we also use the maps for that. Key principle, um, this is kind of like a fourth principle of complexity. Uh, you don't scale a complex adaptive system by aggregation or imitation, but by decomposition and recombination. That's why I said the first time I saw SAFE you know, in a famous blog post where I called it the infantilization of management, and I still stand by that, is SAFE is wrong a priori um, because it doesn't understand how to scale a complex system. So if I take Scrum, I can decompose Scrum to specific elements, like, for example, a sprint. And then I can look at recombining that with other things, as I've done with a JAD, and possibly change the time and possibly use what's called a time box. So I can say there's a variable rate of minimal viable product and there's a variable rate of resource, but you've got to deliver on the time. So by decomposition and recombination of methods and tools, I can very rapidly scale a system and it can be contextually appropriate. Um, all I need to know is the input output between different tools and different tools and methods. And that standardization of input output is a lot easier and a lot less expensive uh, than adopting a massive framework. So three sort of metaphors to finish. Don't forget the wild garden. Yeah. Um, yeah. Formal gardens are wonderful and they're beautiful and they're ordered and they look fantastic. But without the wild garden, if the ecosystem changes, you haven't effectively um, got genetic diversity. And start to think about scaling, not as a sort of you know, a big jump, but a series of small plateaus that you move through so you can change and adapt as you go. So find a couple of points. Remember I talked about bramble bushes in a thicket. Well, these are blackberries, all right? Well, that's a bramble bush. Um, I'm using it to illustrate, and I'm using a quote here from an article that I wrote with Kurtz um, some time ago, which is called Like Bramble Bushes in a Thicket, taking that metaphor. And this picks up on the origin of the word manage in English. So it originally comes, and I'm sorry, my Italian pronunciation is terrible, even though I love Italy and spend a lot of time there. Um, the Italian menagare, which is, the ability to handle and train horses. That's how man, that's the origin of the word manage. Um, it then gets corrupted by the French. And, you know, from a Welsh point of view, many things have been corrupted by the French, but not as many as have been corrupted by the English um, to mean household management. And that's generally how people see it. When people oppose management, they're opposing household management. So we need to start to think about these two different ways of managing. 
Yeah, one is the ability to ride a horse, and the other is the ability to manage a household budget. In Kinevin terms, the household budget is in the ordered domains of clear and complicated, um, whereas the ability to ride a horse is in the complex and the liminal domains and the central domain, which I'm not going to go into at the moment, though it's critical. Um, and the whole point is that you have to start to learn with uncertainty, and the metaphors we use are key. And I'll come back to this fundamental problem. Agile's metaphor is the manufacturing metaphor, which is a rigid linear process, and it needs to move in into an ecological metaphor yeah, as a matter of great urgency. And also, the structured methods and tools effectively are like a household budget. They're the formal garden. They've lost the wildness, which is critical. So just to finish off, this is from a wonderful set of books by Rudyard Kipling called The Jess So Stories. Um, and in one of them, one of my favorite story of all, um, it talks about the domestication of creatures. So man domesticates the cow and the horse and the dog. Um, but the cat wants the benefits of the milk and the warm cave and the fire. But he still wants, and I love this phrase, to be the cat who walks by himself and all places are alike unto him. So basically, he tricks the humans into having this sort of dual existence between the wildness of the night and the domestication of the day. And just to give you something, it's kind of like people who are owned by cats. And there's a white cat on the floor behind me that sooner or later will demand I look after it. People who are owned by cats probably understand complexity. People who own dogs are trying to control it. So... I've sort of hit the 45 minutes, more or less on time. What I've tried to do is to give you a mix mixture of theory and practice. And the sort of final thought I want to leave you is if you don't understand why something worked, you shouldn't try and scale it. If you understand why something worked, then you can scale it safely. And natural science under conditions of uncertainty gives us a much better theoretical framework to understand what can scale. And I've tried to share some of that with you. And also from my own background, my first degree is physics and philosophy as a joint major. Um, no social scientist ever gets enough data to form any valid conclusion. So be deeply, deeply suspicious of anything based on what is called and mistermed empiricism in Agile you know, somebody saying this worked for me last time, or I've studied these 10 companies, or I've done this research, and here's a method. We really need to grow up a bit if we want IT to be a profession. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dave. This is Paul. Great to meet you again. I hope you can hear me. And, yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, great. So in Germany, there is still many people talking about the Cinefin framework when referring to your framework. Can you maybe use your, your chance now to talk to 600 Germans here and, and educate them and Austrian and Switzerland also, of course, but can you uh, educate us uh, like where you took the name from and how we spell it correctly? Yes, I, I should actually um, do a small confession here, right? Uh, my mother was born of a whorehouse in Cardiff Docks in the 1930s and won a scholarship to study German. So she studied German in Hanover in 1947, which was very brave. You know, she had to wear a passport around the neck. But she was told to bring her children up in one language. So those who spoke German, French, Latin and Welsh fluently, she brought us up in English. So I apologize for not being able to speak German. And my mother would still be ashamed of me. You pronounce it Kenevin. Kenevin. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so that's easy. Well, she's actually phonetic, unlike English, but we have a different alphabet. Yeah? Um, the origin of the name is, it's one of the two encounters I had with Nanaka. Nanaka was the guy who created Scrum, if you go back. He also created a thing called the Specky model uh, in knowledge management. And I was one of the first people to oppose it because I said, you can't make tacit knowledge explicit. So the University of Lyon set up a debate between myself and the NACA. And just before the date, he renamed the model from SECI, yeah, socialization, externalization, etc., into BAR, which is a Japanese word for space with deep spiritual significance. And I know what's happening there. The NACA san you know, venerable Japanese management consultant, creates model with name of deep spiritual significance I'm going to lose. 
And I remembered the Welsh equivalent of bar is Kinevin, so I called the framework Kinevin. So now Welsh academic uses, creates model with Welsh name with even deeper spiritual significance, and we've got equality of debate. And, and that's where the name actually comes from. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that story. So um, in our own history of Seabird Media, we had some kind of enlightenment when we actually implemented Scrum like for the first time when we started working accordingly. And it really made it into our vision and mission, mission in the end as an organization. So we really, we, we've been an internet agency back then. And we decided after some years with experience with Scrum and so on to focus on collaboration within organizations. So it really was a changing thing for us. And um, my question would be, if I get it right, that you say, if people are in some large scale environment, for example, and they are learning it more mechanical, then they miss out this kind of enlightening moment, actually, and how this could change the, the way of collaboration. I think you've got a couple of things. First of all, there's a thing called Hawthorne effect. So in the 1920s, um, people experimented with working conditions in a cable manufacturer in Hawthorne in the United States. So they increased the lighting levels and people became more productive. Now, if they were agilists, they would now publish a book called Light the Secret to Productivity and run certification courses. But then they thought they were real scientists, so they lowered the lighting level and people became more productive. Now, one of the things we know from this is anything novel will always work the first few times. Because you're paying attention to people and you're doing something, you and human beings respond to that. The scaling is where it's different. Now, Scrum has scaled. But a lot of agile methods have fallen from that. But you will have got a Hawthorne effect at the start. The key thing in terms of communication um, is to increase the density of your informal networks, not your formal system. And this is a mistake agile people often make. They want everything to be explicit. The reality is, and when I did the original studies on this in IBM, the ratio between formal and informal is 1 to 64. So by increasing the density of people's informal trusted networks, you radically improve communication at low energy cost. So informal networks are more important than formal systems. And the interface between the formal and the informal yeah, is where you manage it. Yeah? So, and if, if you want to know more about this, I'm writing about it a lot at the moment. There are methods like social network stimulation which means in 18 months, I can get everybody to within two degrees of separation of everybody else in an organization based on a trusted working relationship. And if I do that, I don't need to worry about communication flow anymore because I've built an ecosystem uh, which can handle it for me. And um, we have many people that work in a team or uh, with teams in a larger context. And if they are inspired by your message and want to take it uh, back to their teams within this larger context, is there any kind of recommendation that you would give them to uh, like, like implement the, uh, the things that they learned during this talk? Well, I've given you two or three methods. I'd experiment with them. I think the fundamental message I was trying to get across is don't adopt one method yeah, or one approach. And as I say, I mean, things like safe largely work because good consultants make them work despite the framework, not because of the framework. Uh, and they bring other things in and they vary it. So start to think about, you know, Scrum's done very well for us. What are the limits of its applicability? And what do we do on the other boundary? And we see this all the time. So business process re-engineering came in. It was extremely effective to improve manufacturing, but it was appalling for customer relationship management. Yeah. Pop. And when it didn't work for customer relationship management, people went for Six Sigma. They tried to do it harder. So understand the boundaries of applicability of a method and do different things on either side of the boundary. So a multi-methods approach. And I've given you several examples of things to do. Okay, cool. Um, you also discussed about agile values and uh, like using those as an orientation point, more or less. Um, but I would I would actually like to switch over to the to the culture topic that you also covered. Mm. And you said like uh, more like these and fewer like those as an orientation point, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, do you see this already getting used in organizations a lot? Do we have some examples there, like organizations using this? 
Yeah, there's, there's some in Germany. We actually licensed Agile 42 to bring a, to build a tool based on this, which is German based. So you can always have a look at that. It's, um, so they, that, that's what we call sense powered by SenseMaker. Um, we've also done a series of projects. We've been doing this with Walters and others in Romania, um, looking at using narrative based approaches to retrospectives, for example. So capturing narratives people go and actually deriving the culture from those stories, so deriving it indirectly. And there's a lot of work on this in the health service as well, um, worldwide. So it's it's an established technique. The key thing is to understand culture emerges from the way people have conversations. It's not something you can engineer. So the minute somebody you should, said, yeah, you should then on. focus on uh, facilitating this kind of conversations. You should focus on not no not in workshops because the problem with workshops is the facilitator bias is the outcome, right? And it's a power relationship. So some of the big issues we got in agile for the moment, example, are a widespread misogyny that is still a major issue. Yeah, and we've got what's called epistemic injustice, and the problem with sort of highly facilitated environments is they get dominated by one or two people. What we're focusing on is highly distributed systems, yeah, in which people self-interpret their own stories. They're not facilitated to do it. They're responsible for the interpretation. And then we look for the patterns that emerge from that. So complexity is about mapping the current patterns and nudging them in the right direction, not trying to decide what your outcome should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you also Paul, talked about, yeah. May I interrupt you? Yes, sure. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we have promised the audience to pass along their questions. There is overwhelming feedback and a huge dis discussion about the correct pronunciation of Knaven. So, um, <laughs> but, but we have three questions and we only have five minutes left. So I would like to pass the questions of the audience to you first, Dave. The first Thank one you. is from Michael Kramer. Michael, he has the question, doesn't the effort and cost of trios require a certain mindset? to be present within a company in order to be possible and successful? Um, first of all, I would ban the word mindset. I, th I think uh, it's, it's, it actually isn't the case. We don't have mental models. That was a cute concept in the 80s, but we've moved on from that now. We have very complex patterns of interaction. The way you introduce new things is to deal with the intractable problems. So setting up trios is virtually zero cost. And if you say, let's experiment with this, if it gets us better story points, then we might actually have fewer failures at the end of the development process. It's worth experimenting. Right? So if I deploy 10 trios, it's actually a lot less expensive than deploying an analyst team to interview people. So you, could, you can argue for it that way. But the key thing on introducing novelty is find the intractable problem, the thing where the existing methods are failing, and offer an experiment to try something new there. And trios are a really low cost, high effective approach there. Okay, thank you. The other question is from uh, Tanya Seehase. Uh, Dave, how do you see that as a so so sociologist? I have the feeling that the IT Agile community is more and more interested or should be interested in social systems of system theory, Luhmann, etc., in order to find their way in complex systems. What's your opinion on that? Well, we need to be careful here because, as I say, I, I do philosophy and philosophers you know, have a problem with sociologists, so I'll try and avoid that prejudice. I think we need the humanities are desperately needed. Um, I wrote a paper for the last ITIL book, which you might want to get hold of, which basically says nobody should be allowed to be a systems engineer without training in ethics. Because the consequences of the software we're building at the moment require you to understand the ethical implications of it. Um, if you want to understand users, do some basic anthropology or sociology because it will teach you more about people than anything else. And there's a general issue, and I'm, I'm completely agree with her on this. If you go back to school, when I was at the school, the headmaster, we were very progressive. We had the first computer in Wales. It was a 250-bow modem device to the local college. And I wrote the first program on it to fake my physics practicals because I found physics practicals boring. So I generated the results. Yeah? But we were taught to use a punch card machine. And we were told we would have a job for life if we learned to use this. The modern equivalent of that is teaching kids JavaScript. By the time they get into jobs, everything will have changed. 
what we should be teaching people is how to understand people and systems because the technologies can come later. And we're generating a whole tradition of people in Agile who've spent their entire time on computer screens doing mathematics and coding, and they lack the ability to relate to users or relate to the wider population. So absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. The last question from, uh, from Paul Friedhelm Günther, and we only have two minutes left. He says, Dave, I'm feeling stuck in helping a team become Agile, although I know it is not possible to become. How can I become wild again and maybe a better guide for my team to tackle their challenges? Okay. Um, first of all, I think go back to those three principles, yeah? Look at the area you are, break things down into smaller units, get more perspectives in and start to play directly with the data and see what you can do. You've got tremendous capability to actually influence executives yeah, and influence buyers by showing them something you can do that they didn't expect. That's how you do novelty, yeah? Um, and you've got access to keys and tools. But the key thing is go and do things and see what happens, rather than sit in a workshop and decide how things should be. Dave, uh, as we're running out of time, uh, let me uh, get the last uh, question in. Um, <laughs> Pia just said, Können wir bitte den ganzen Tag weiter Q&A mit Dave machen? So in English, uh, could he please continue doing Q&A with Dave for the whole day? Uh, unfortunately, Pia, we cannot. But um, if I was like Pia and other people are also interested in your thoughts and your publications, how do I get hold of Dave Snowden and his writings? How do I follow you? Where do you publish the most? How do okay. I do that? And I love blogging. Blog blogging is my, it's why the book hasn't come out yet, because I always have another blog to write. So, so what's the, the, the URL? www.cognitive-edge.com. Yeah. Um, so there's blogs on that. The, we've just got a new website, so the article's up there. But if you look at, if you do, if you hit my name on YouTube, I mean, it, it used to be you always got me, but now there's somebody related to me in Russia who gets higher hits. All right, um, but um, look on YouTube. Look at other people presenting Kinevin. Liz Keo has done some really good um, videos on on Kinevin. Yeah, um, there's articles, and we run both retreats, exploratories, and training courses. We're probably going to set up some open clinics um, for people to come and ask questions in the new year. But yeah, you can get me on the website anyway. You can always email me there. Cool. Then um, thanks a lot for your time, Dave. That was awesome. Pleasure. And, um, We will talk to him uh, later yeah. again, right? Uh, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I'm booked in this so, afternoon. So yeah. especially for uh, Pia, there's another slot where you can uh, join the main stage. Um, thanks for being part of the uh, show, Dave. Thanks, Paul. Um, I don't know whether he's still here because uh, he has to maintain his own track. So he had to leave early, I assume. Um, Uh, so thank you, Dave. We'll um, uh, see you later.